All people on the earth had one language and the same words. When they traveled east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them hard. They used bricks for stones and asphalt for mortar. They said, Come, let's build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. And let us make a name for ourselves so that we won't be dispersed over the earth. Then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the humans built. And the Lord said, there is now one people and they all have one language. This is what they have begun to do. And now all that they plan to do will be possible for them. Come, let's go down and mix up their language there so that they don't understand each other's language. <coughs> then the Lord dispersed them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, it is named Babel. Babel, 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 Babel. Because there the Lord mixed up the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over all the earth. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. So we are um, talking this season about creation spirituality, which reminds us to, to look, to pay attention to where God is in creation and what God has done and is still doing within creation so that we can learn a bit more about who God is and about our relationship with God. And when I think about creation, I see great diversity. I see diversity in so many ways. At the children's time, we talked about all of the colors that we see in the windows um, because we did a, the artists did a lovely job of bringing in so many of the different colors that exist. But I put this slide on the screen because when I look around, plants have no problem being together even though they're different. You know, my this is from one of my flower beds and the bleeding heart is right in there with the Siberian iris and the forsythia is trying to make its way and and they're just they, they just make room for each other, or sometimes not, right? <laughs> my weeds do a great job of, of trying to overwhelm my vegetables in the garden and all of that. But, but they do, and they don't, obviously they don't think, but, but they exist, they coexist together. Well, then let's look at animals. The easiest ones for me to take pictures of are my own. And so on the left are my girls. Um, they are of different breeds, and they get along just fine. And then we can walk across the street to my son's, where he has the boys. We call them the boys. We've got the girls. He's got the boys. And we can put all four of them together, and all four will get along just fine. It was hard to get a picture with somebody not moving, but, um, you know, they all get along. If if they divide, they're more apt to divide based on energy level. Like the two puppies will get into something um, that the older two have no reason or interest in. But they don't, they don't divide based on color or breed. Well, they, they'd be all different. They're all four different breeds. But they don't divide the way we divide the way humanity does. Humanity, for some reason, has decided 
um, that some of us are more privileged than others. To me, it's like we started playing King of the Mountain. Do you remember that game when you were a kid? Or do you remember your kids playing that game? King of the Mountain is where there's a hill and somebody tries to get to the top and then they defend the hill. <laughs> and they don't let anybody else get up to the hill or get higher than them. It seems like we get caught in that and we're still playing that now. That we're all trying to be at the top of the hill. And if anybody comes near us, we do whatever we can to make sure they don't overtake the hill. I want you to keep that in mind as we listen to the story for today, as we look at this scripture. I'm, I'm going to do this today a little bit more in the, in the style of a um, Bible study. So I'm going to invite you to, to open Bibles um, open it up to the, the book of Genesis. That's where we're starting. And while you get your, the Bibles out, let me just tell you a little bit about Genesis. You already know that it's the first book in the Bible. But more than that, you need to know that there's several authors that authored Genesis. And this, our reading for today was probably done by what the scholars call the Yahwehist, because God is referred to as the Lord, and the Lord comes down to earth and, and, and associates with the people. There's, it's an anthropomorphic view of God. And, and we see that. We see that in Genesis 2 also, where God comes down and, and interacts with, seems to walk the garden with Adam and Eve. And in this one, God comes down and interacts with the people. So you need to know that. You also need to know that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are not meant to be written or to be read as a historical novel or a historical, maybe a historical novel maybe, but, but not as history, okay? They're, they're more like a parable, they weren't written down as it was happening, but there are ways in which people over the years determine or try to explain how things are the way they are. And our story for today, I think we'll see, is one of the ways that they tried to explain how we have so many differences in the world, how we have so many different languages and so many different kinds of people. Um, it's not, it's not meant to be a true story, um, but it's, it's meant to give us an idea. So in Genesis, I actually want you to turn to the 10th chapter, because that's where we're going to start looking at the scripture, um, before our actual um, scripture for today. But in, in Genesis 6, we had the flood. Um, and we know... The, the, the story of the flood, right, is that only Noah's family survives. So in chapter 10, then we, we start to get a, a feel for how, how are there more people than just Noah's family? How are we not, you know, just Noah's family? Um, and so chapter 10 goes into the lineage of, of Noah, and I gave you a shortened version on the screen because the screen is only so big. <laughs> and if I put everybody's names up, you wouldn't read any of it. But I wanted you to see the particular line that we're going to follow for today's story. So we have Noah, and then we have the three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And then we're not going to worry about Shem and Japheth. You can read in chapter 10 <laughs> who all their children were. But we're going to follow Ham. Ham had four, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. Hopefully Egypt and Canaan kind of ring a bell like, hmm, that's interesting that that would be a name of, of one of Noah's grandsons. And then if you thought, but we're only going to follow Cush. Cush came down, and Cush had at least six child, male children. Female children don't tend to get named in 
in lineages because it doesn't, they didn't count. Let's just put it that way. Um, and, and it, so chapter six, uh, verse six is where it says the descendants of Ham and then you, you get, and then the descendants of Cush in chapter eight. And then you hit chapter eight says, or verse 8, sorry, this is chapter 10, verse 8, Cush became the father of Nimrod. Like, he gets his own sentence. He's got all these other kids, but Nimrod gets his own sentence. And not only does he get his own sentence, but then it goes on, he gets a couple verses just to Nimrod because he was a mighty warrior. And it goes on and on about this about a mighty hunter before the Lord. So he did, he did follow God, but, but the writer really wants us to understand that he's a fighter, okay? If he gets to the top of the hill and we're playing king of the hill, Nimrod's not coming down easy, right? They have this, this was a, you know, one of the, the carvings having him fight a lion by, with his bare hands. Not something I would want to do, but um, he was so strong and so brave that he was willing to, he was sort of unstoppable. Now I want you to go to chapter 11, where our, where our story goes. We need to know about Nimrod because Nimrod is the leader of this group. The whole earth had one language and the same words. When we talk about that, we have to remember that their idea of the earth was pretty small. The whole earth was as much as they could know of it. They had no idea so, so that it's, it's, it's men in that parable sense that everyone that they ran into, they expected at that point, they expected that everybody looked the same, talked the same, understood each other. And then they came to a land of Shinar and settled there. The land of Shinar so I gave you on the left, Nimrod's, a, a map of where Nimrod's kingdom would have been. And on the right, I gave you a more contemporary map, since maps keep changing. But a more contemporary, so that you can see the land of Shinar is that space between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which there's plenty of other um, traditions and, and stories and, and parables or legends in the world that that's where humanity started in, in that area between the Euphrates and the Tigris. And those rivers are both run through what is now Iraq. So that is probably where humanity started. And that's the space, this fertile valley between these rivers is where this story supposedly took place. So they came and they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. If you think about really, you know, going back, the beginning of humanity, um, what, do, you know, what do you think houses were made of? What do you think shelters were made of before bricks? Stone, sticks. If you, if, you go, if you go down to Honduras, they're made of sticks and tarps. They didn't have tarps back then, but they would have had skin, you know, animal skin. Animal skin, sticks, stones, whatever they could find. So when we read in this that this group under Nimrod figured out how that they would make bricks. 
a new building material. Not just a new building material, but they also figured out mortar. They figured out a way to not just stack the bricks on top of each other, which would at some point fall down, but a way to make them more permanent so that whatever they built was going to stand and was going to be able to handle the rains and the winds. This is really talking about Nimrod, a great warrior who's not afraid of anything, now having the technology to do things that they, didn't, that they couldn't do before. If we take that kind of scenario and put it in our contemporary context, if we had a warrior who wasn't afraid of anything and then got developed technology that nobody else had, what would we think of that person? What kind of words would we use for someone like that? Scary, is that what I heard? Visionary. Visionary. You go. Leader. Leader. Yeah. But maybe a threat, too? Because we don't know what, we don't, you know, he's on the side of God right now. So he can be a visionary leader. But if he decides to leave God, maybe not so much. You have to wonder if that didn't play into how this story goes. Seems like a setup for Nimrod. Um, and so the Lord comes down and sees the city and realizes that if all the people actually worked together, if they all got along and worked to de- together, they would be unstoppable. That doesn't seem like a bad thing, does it? Seems like a good thing. Like if we all work together, we can find the cures to cancer, right? We can find the, the answers that we want to help people have a better life. But then we get this part that is quite unsettling. Because God, the story, please, please understand this isn't truth, but the story exp- puts within God's purview that says, come, let us go down. And you got to stop and go, who's us? How did God cer- suddenly become plural? Who is that us that God takes with him? And confuse their language as if God doesn't want us to be successful. I don't think that's the point. I don't think the point is that God doesn't want us to be successful, but I think the point is that they, it wants to give us a reason why there are people in the world who are different from us, who, ha- who speak a different language, And they want to attribute that all to God. But it's not really clear. And it's interesting, though, to note that the the word, the Hebrew word that is transcribed as as Babel is the same as Babylonian. And, And that kingdom, you can see Assyria. You can see there's, and Babylonia. Those became empires. They became empires. So it's hard to, it's hard to see what, what God might have been up to in that other than people trying to understand 
why there are so many differences. So I don't have answers for you. Just bring up questions. Just sometimes these stories just make us stop and think, what's, what's, what's up with that? What's that about? But I think when I look at, at the greater creation, I think God is calling us to work together, to see how we can come together with, with all of the diversity that we have, all of the different abilities that we have. Because when we come together, we are more fully the body of Christ. We are more fully what God intends the world to be. But we get hung up on playing that game. And so I'm going to tell you a story um, that just happened, a true story. The last week you heard um, Holly Climo talked about, or there's some of us that are working on changing the funding for Pennsylvania public education. Well, one of the people in the group with, with me is Rabbi Jack Paskoff. And Rabbi Paskoff was invited to go to McCaskey and give a blessing at a dinner for the International Baccalaureate students. There's, uh, at McCaskey, there's an International Baccalaureate program where students can, they take the class, they take the classes, and then if they, based on how they do in the classes, uh, they can earn the privilege of taking a test which would give them college credit. And it's international. The test is given all over the world. Um, and what, what Rabbi Paskoff noticed when he went to the, well, he's, let me back up. He has gone to the, the, the international baccalaureate classes and taught some of their classes on comparative religion and world religions. Um, he, Rabbi Paskoff is often invited to speak about the Jewish faith, um, and um, he is willing to share his knowledge with us. And he's, very, he's a very smart and very um, well-educated person. But when he went to the dinner and saw the students that were, well, the classes normally look like the high school students at McCaskey. It's a variety. White, African-American, Latino, Latina, all, all different kinds of, of students. But when he went to the dinner for those who were taking the test, all the students were white. And he said, why aren't there any students of color here? Because I know they're in the program. I've taught the classes. Why are only the students, white students, taking the test? And the teacher said, because only the white students earn or do whatever they need to do to be able to, to um, the word's escaping me right now, I'm sorry, to be given the right to take the test. Only the white students get that far because the other students are living in poverty and they don't have access to the materials that the white students do. They don't have computers and internet at home to be studying the same way. They don't have mentors and they don't have the funds to pay for people to mentor them so that they can qualify for the test. That's a problem. That's a problem. It's not that the rules don't say that only white children, only white students can take the test. The rules say if you qualify, you take the test. But if you don't have the support to help you learn the information 
and retain the information. If you're still worried about whether there's going to be food on the table, or if you have to leave school to go work because you have to help earn money to pay the bills at home, then you don't have that extra time to study and to make the cut for the test. This is just a contemporary story about a way in which we have a system that is set up to privilege some children over others. And I want you to, to sit this week and think about the ways in which you see that play out in our, in our community, in our world. Who are the Nimrods that are at the top of the hill, not letting anybody else climb up? Because that's not who God calls us to be. May it be so. Amen. Thank you.